Who hasn't heard of the Artful Dodger, the eponymous name for a pickpocket of Victorian London from Charles Dickens' novel Oliver Twist? A child and a criminal, yes, but skillful, cunning, and never lacking in character. On meeting Oliver, he attempts to drag him into the dark world of thievery into which he himself has fallen, but eventually ends up in court and finds himself sentenced to a new world himself. On the other side of the globe, his character is as rich as the watches and silk handkerchiefs he thieves from ladies and gentlemen. This famous story was no mere fantasy. Child pickpockets really did craft their dark arts from seasoned criminals and distributed their ill-gotten gains to master thieves, like Fagin, the novel's infamous antagonist, alongside Bill Sykes, and roamed the streets of the metropolis in search of gentleman's coattails for easy pickings. If you found yourself in 19th century London with valuable watches or purses, you are highly likely to have your pockets felt. Today you will hear the story of a pickpocket from a genuine account by Henry Mayhew, a Victorian journalist who concerned himself with the lives of London's poor. You will learn in much detail how this boy fell into a life of crime, crafted his skills, chose victims, lived a high life on the proceeds of his crimes, as well as the numerous times he was caught and sentenced to prison. Before we move on, please consider clicking the subscribe button for more content like this. If you find this video interesting, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and share it widely with friends and family. Please check out the description to see how you can support the channel and the content we make. The following story was given us by a young man who had till lately been an adroit pickpocket in various districts of London, but has now become a patterer, street peddler, for his livelihood. He is about the middle height of shadow complexion with a rich, dark, penetrating eye, a moustache and a beard. He is a man of tolerably good education and has a most intelligent mind, well furnished with reading and general information. At the time we met him, he was rather melancholy and crushed in spirit, which he stated was the result of repeated imprisonments and the anxiety and suspense connected with his wild criminal life and the heavy trials he has undergone. The woman who cohabits with him was then in one of the London prisons, and he was residing in a low lodging house in the west end of the metropolis. While giving us several exciting passages in his narrative, his countenance lightened up with intense interest and adventurous expression, though his general demeanor was calm and collected. As we endeavored to inspire him with hope in an honest career, he mournfully shook his head as he looked forward to the difficulties in his path. He was then shabbily dressed in a dark frock coat, dark trousers, and a cap. We give his narrative almost verbatim. I was born in a little hamlet five miles from Shrewsbury in the county of Shropshire in October 1830, and am now thirty-one years of age. My father was a Wesleyan minister and died in 1854 after being subject to the yellow jaundice for five or six years, during which time he was not able to officiate. My mother was a Yorkshire woman, and her father kept a shoemaker's shop in the town of Full Sutton. I had two brothers, one of them older and the other younger than I, and a sister two years younger. I went to school to learn to write and cipher and had before this learned to read at home with my father and mother. We had a very happy home, and very strict in the way of religion. I lived very happy and comfortable at home, but always compelled, though against my own inclination, to go twice to service on the Sunday, and twice during the week. I always seemed to have a rebellious nature against these religious services and they were a disagreeable task to me, though my father took more pains with me than with my brothers and sister. I always rebelled against this in my heart, 
though I did not display it openly. My mind at this time was injured by the narrow religious prejudices I saw around me. We often had ministers to dinner and supper at our house, and always after the meals the conversation would be sure to turn into discussions on the different points of doctrine. I can remember as well now as though it were yesterday the text used on the various sides of the question, and the stress laid on different passages to uphold their arguments. At this time, I would be sitting there greedily drinking in every word, and as soon as they were gone, I would fly to the Bible and examine the different texts of Scripture they had brought forward. And it seemed to produce a feeling in my mind that any religious opinions could be plausibly supported by it. The arguments on these occasions generally hinged on two main points, predestination and election. My father's opinions were those of the Wesleyan creed, the salvation of all through the blood of Christ. And these continual discussions seemed to steal my heart completely against religion. They caused me to be very disobedient and unruly, and led to my falling out with my grandfather, who had a good deal of property that was expected to come to our family. Though I was young, he bitterly resented this. In 1839, he was accidentally drowned, and it was found when his will was opened that I was not mentioned in it. The whole of his property was left to my father, with the exception of four houses, which he had an interest in till my brothers and sisters arrived at the age of twenty-one. Again, the property that was left to my father for the whole of his life, he had no power to will away at his death, as it went to a distant relative of my grandfather's. This was the first cause of my leaving home. It seemed to rankle in my boyish mind that I was a black sheep, something different from my brothers and sister. After being several times spoken to by my father about the quarrelsome disposition with my brothers and sister, I threatened, young as I was, to burn the house down the first opportunity I got. This threat, though not uttered in my father's hearing, came to his ear, and he gave me a severe beating for it the first time he ever corrected me. This was in the summer of 1840. In the end of May, I determined to leave home and tuck nothing away but what belonged to me. I had four sovereigns of pocket money and the suit of clothes I had on and a shirt. I walked to Shrewsbury and tucked the coach to London. When I got to London, I had neither friend nor acquaintance. I first put up in a coffee shop at the Mile End Road and lodged there for seven weeks, till my money was nearly all spent. During this time, my clothes had been getting shabby and dirty, having no one to look after me. After being there for seven weeks, I went to a mean lodging house at Fields Lane, Holborn. There I met with characters I'd never seen before and heard language that I had not formerly heard. This was July, 1840. I was about ten years of age the ensuing October. I stopped there about three weeks doing nothing. At the end of that time, I was completely destitute. The landlady took pity on me as a poor country boy who had been well brought up and kept me for some days longer after my money was done. During these days I had very little to eat, except what was given me by some of the lodgers when they got their own meals, I often thought at that time of my home in the country, and of what my father and mother might be doing, as I had never written to them since the day I had first left my home. I sometimes was almost tempted to write to them and let them know the position I was in, as I knew they would gladly send me up money to return home. But my stubborn spirit was not broke then. After being totally destitute for two or three days, I was turned out of doors, a little boy in the great world of London, with no friend to assist me, and perfectly ignorant in the ways and means of getting a living in London. I was taken by several poor ragged boys to sleep in the dark arches of the Adelphi. I often saw the boys follow the male passengers when the halfpenny boats came to the Adelphi stairs, that is, the 
part of the river almost opposite to the Adelphi Theatre. I could not at first make out the meaning of this, but I soon found they generally had one or two handkerchiefs when the passengers left. <laughs> at this time, there was a prison van in the Adelphi Arches, without wheels, which was constructed different from the present prison van, as it had no boxes in the interior. The boys used to take me with them into the prison van. There we used to meet a man my companions called Larry. I knew him by no other name for the time. He used to give almost what price he liked for the handkerchiefs. If they refused to give them at the price he named, he would threaten them in several ways. He said he would get the other boys to drive them away and not allow them to get any more handkerchiefs there. If this did not intimidate them, he would threaten to give them in charge, so that at last they were compelled to take whatever price he liked to give them. I have seen handkerchiefs I afterwards found out to be the value of four or five shillings, sold him lumped together at nine pence each. The boys, during this time, had been very kind to me, sharing what they got with me, but always asking why I did not try my hand, till at last I was ashamed to live any longer upon the food they gave me, without doing something for myself. One of the boys attached himself to me more than the others, whom we used to call Joe Muckraw. He was afterwards transported, and is now in a comfortable position in Australia. Joe said to me that when the next boat came in, if any man came out likely to carry a good handkerchief, he would let me have a chance at it. I recollect when the boat came in that evening. I think it was the last one, about nine o'clock. I saw an elderly gentleman step ashore and a lady with him. They had a little dog with a string attached to it that they led along. Before Joe said anything to me, he had fanned the gentleman's pocket. That is, had felt the pocket and knew there was an handkerchief. He whispered to me, now, Dick, have a try. And I went to the old gentleman's side, trembling all the time, and Joe standing close to me in the dark, and went with him up the steep hill of the Adelphi. He had just passed a, an apple store there. Joe was still following us, encouraging me all the time, while the old gentleman was engaged with the little dog. I took out a green Kingsman, handkerchief next in value to a black silk handkerchief. They are used a good deal as neckerchiefs by costermongers. The gentleman did not perceive his loss. We immediately went to the arches and entered the van where Larry was, and Joe said to him, There is Dick's first trial, and you must give him a ray for it. That was uh, one shilling sixpence. After a deal of pressing, we got one shilling for it. After that, I gained confidence and in the course of a few weeks I was considered the cleverest of the little band, never missing one boat coming in and getting one or two handkerchiefs on each occasion. During the time we knew there were no boats coming, we used to waste our money on sweets and fruits, and went often in the evenings to the Victoria Theatre and Bower Saloon and other places. When we came out at twelve or half-past twelve at night, we went to the arches again, and slept in the prison van. This was the life I led till January 1841. During that month, several men came to us. I did not know, although I afterwards heard they were brought by Larry to watch me, as he had been speaking of my cleverness at the tail, that is, stealing from the tails of gentlemen's coats, and they used to make me presents. It seemed they were not satisfied altogether with me, for they did not tell me what they wanted, nor speak their mind to me. About the middle of the month, I was seized by a gentleman who caught me with his handkerchief in my hand. I was taken to Bow Street Police Station and got two months in Westminster Bridewell. I came out in March, and when outside the gate of Westminster Bridewell, there was a cab waiting for me and two of the men standing by who had often made me presents and spoken to me in the arches. They asked me if I would go with them, and tucked me into the cab. 
I was willing to go anywhere to better myself, and went with them to Flower and Dean Street, Brick Lane, Whitechapel. They took me to their own home. One of them had the first floor of a house there, the other had the second. Both were living with women, and I found out shortly afterwards that these men had lately had a boy, but he was transported about that time, though I did not know this then. They gave me plenty to eat, and one of the women, by name Emily, washed and cleansed me, and I got new clothes to put on. For three days I was not asked to do anything, but in the meantime they had been talking to me of going with them and having no more to do with the boys at the Adelphi, or with the tail, but to work at picking ladies' pockets. I thought it strange at first, but found afterwards that it was more easy to work on a woman's pocket than upon a man's. For this reason, more persons worked together, and the boy is well surrounded by companions older than himself, and is shielded from the eyes of the passers-by. And, besides, it pays better. It was on a Saturday, in company with three men, I set out on an excursion from Flower and Dean Street along Cheapside. They were young men, from nineteen to twenty-five years of age, dressed in fashionable style. I was clothed in the suit given me when I came out of prison. A beaver hat, a little sort two coat and trousers, both of black cloth, and a black silk necktie and collar, dressed as a gentleman's son. We went into a pastry cook shop in St. Paul's churchyard about half past two in the afternoon and had pastry there. And they were watching the ladies coming into the shop till at last they followed one out, taking me with them. As this was my first essay in having anything to do in stealing from a woman, I believe they were nervous themselves. But they had well tutored me during the two or three days I had been out of prison. They had stood against me in the room while Emily walked to and fro, and I had practised on her pocket by taking out sometimes a lady's clasp purse, termed a port money, and other articles out of her pocket, and thus I was not quite ignorant of what was expected of me. One walked in front of me, one on my right hand, and the other in the rear, and I had the lady on my left hand. I immediately fanned her, felt her pocket, as she stopped to look in at an osier's window, when I took her purse and gave it to one of them, and we immediately went to an house in Giltspur Street. We there examined what was in the purse. I think there was a sovereign, and about seventeen shillings. I cannot speak positively how much. The purse was thrown away, as it is the general rule, and we went down Newgate Street into Cheapside, and there we soon got four more purses that afternoon and went home by five o'clock in the afternoon. I recollect how they praised me afterwards that night at home for me cleverness. I think we did not go out again till the Tuesday. And that and the following day we had a good pull. It amounted to about nineteen pound each. They always take care to allow the boy to see what is in the purse, and to give him his proper share equal with the others, because he is their sole support. If they should lose him, they would be unable to do anything till they got another. Out of my share, which was about nineteen pounds, I bought a silver watch and a gold chain, and about this time I also bought an overcoat and carried it on my left arm to cover my movements. A few weeks after this we went to the Surrey Gardens, and I got two purses from ladies. In one of them were some French coins and a ring, that was afterwards advertised as either lost or stolen in the garden. We did very well that visit, and were thinking of going again, when I was caught in Fleet Street, and they had no means of getting me away, though they tried all they could to secure my escape. They could not do it without exposing themselves to too much suspicion. I was sentenced to three months' imprisonment in Bridge Street Bridewell, Blackfriars, termed by the thieves the Old Horse. <laughs> This was shortly before Christmas, 1840. During my imprisonment, I did not live on the prison diet, but was kept on good rations, supplied to me through the kindness of my comrades out of doors, bribing the turnkeys. I had tea of a morning, bread and butter, and often cold meat. Meat and all kinds of pastry was sent to me from a cookshop outside, 
and I was allowed to sit up later than the other prisoners. During the time I was in prison for these three months, I learned to smoke, as cigars were introduced to me. When I came out, we often used to attend the theatres, and I often had as many as six or seven ladies' purses in the rear of the boxes during the time they were coming out. This was the time when the pantomimes were in their full attraction. It is easier to pick a female's pocket when she has several children with her to attract her attention than if she was there by herself. We went out once or twice a week, sometimes stopped in an hour week, and sallied out on Sunday. I often got purses coming down the steps at Spitalfields Church. I believe I've done so hundreds of times. The church was near to us and easily got out. We went to Madame Tussauds, Baker Street, and were pretty lucky there. At this time, we hired horses in a trap to go to the Absom races, but did not take any of the women with us. I was generally employed working in the streets rather than at places of amusement, etc., and was in dread that my father or some of my friends might come and see me at some of these. When at the Epsom races, shortly after the termination of the race for the derby, I was induced, much against my will, to turn my hand upon two ladies as they were stepping into a carriage, and was detected by the ladies. There was immediately an outcry, but I was got away by two of my comrades. The other threw himself in the way, and kept them back, was taken up on suspicion, committed for trial, and got four months imprisonment. I kept with the other men, and we got another man in his place. When his time was expired, they went down to meet him, and he did not go out for some time afterwards, for nearly a fortnight. After that, we went out, and had different degrees of luck, and one of the men was seized with a decline, and died at Brompton in the hospital. Like the other stalls, he usually went well dressed, and had a good appearance. His chief work was to guard me and get me out of difficulty when I was detected, as I was the support of the band. About this time, as nearly as I can recollect, when I was two months over thirteen years of age, I first kept a woman. We had apartments, a front and back room for our own. She was a tall, thin, genteel girl, about fifteen years of age, and very good-looking. I often ill-used her and beat her. She bore it patiently till I carried it too far, and at last she left me in the summer of 1844. During the time she was with me, which lasted for nearly nine or ten months, I was very fortunate, and was never without twenty or thirty pounds in my pocket. While she had the same in hers, I was dressed in fashionable style, and had a gold watch and gold guard. Meantime, I had been busy with these men, as usual, going to Cheapside, St. Paul's Churchyard, and Fleet Street. In the end of the year, 1844, I was taken up for an attempt on a lady in St. Martin's Lane, near Ben Conte's. A conviction was brought against me from the city, and I got six months at Tothill Fields Prison. This was my first real imprisonment of any length. At first, uh, I was a month in Tothill Fields, and afterwards three months in the city Bridewell, Blackfriars, where I had a good deal of indulgence and did not feel the imprisonment so much. The silent system was strict, and being very willful, I was often under punishment. It had such an effect on me that for the last six weeks of my imprisonment, I was in the infirmary. The men came down to meet me when my punishment expired, and I again accompanied them to their house. During the time I'd been in prison, they'd got another boy, but they said they would willingly turn him away or give him to some other men. But I, being self-willed, said they might keep him. I had another reason for parting with them. When I went to prison, I had property worth a good deal of money. On coming out, I found they had sold it, and they never gave me value of it. They pretended it was laid out in my defence, which I knew was only a pretext. Before I was imprisoned, my girl had parted from me, which was the beginnings of my misfortunes. I would not go to work with them afterwards. I did the money, and at a public house I met with two men living down Gravel Lane, Ratcliffe Highway. I went down there and commenced working with two of them on ladies' pockets, but in a different part of the town. We went to Whitechapel and the Commercial Road, but had not worked six weeks with them before I was taken up again and was tried at Old Harper Square 
and got three months' imprisonment at Cold Bath Fields. If I thought Tothill Fields was bad, I found the other worse. When I got out, I had no one to meet me, and thought I would work by myself. It was about this time I commenced to steal gentlemen's watches. The first I took was from the fob of a countryman in Smithfield on a market day. It was a silver watch, which we called a frying pan. It had not a guard, but an old chain and seals. It fetched me about eighteen shillings. I took off one of the seals, which was gold, which brought me as much as the watch, if not more. I sold it to a man I was acquainted with on Field Lane, where I first lodged, after leaving the coffee shop when I first came to London, and where the landlady gave me several nights lodging gratuitously. I repaid her the small sum due to her for her former kindness to me. I lodged there, and shortly after cohabited with another female. She was a big stout woman, ten years older than I, well made, but coarse featured. I did not live it along, only three or four months. I was then only fifteen years of age. During that time I always worked by myself. Sometimes she would go out with me, but she was no help to me. I looked out for crowds at fairs, at fires, and on any occasion where there was a gathering of people, as at this time I generally confined myself to watches and pins from men. I was not so lucky then, and barely kept myself in respectability. My woman was very extravagant, and swallowed up all I could make. I lived with her about four months, when I was taken up in Exmouth Street, Clerkenwell, and got four months' imprisonment in Cold Bath Fields Prison. When my sentence was expired, she came to meet me at the gate of the prison, and we remained together only two days, when I heard reports that she had been unfaithful to me. I never charged her with it, but ran away from her. When I left her, I went to live in Charles's Street, Drury Lane. I stopped there working by myself for five or six months, and got acquainted with a young woman who has ever since been devoted to me. She is now thirty-three years of age, but looks a good deal older than she is, and is about the middle height. We took a room and furnished it. I soon got acquainted with some of the swell mob of the Seven Dials, and went working along with three of them upon the ladies' purses again. At this time, I was a great deal luckier with them than I had been since I had left Tothill Fields Prison. I worked with them till April 1847, visiting the chief places of public resort such as the Surrey Gardens, Regent's Park, Zoological Gardens, Madame Tussauds, the Colosseum, and other places. Other two comrades and I were arrested at the Colosseum for picking a lady's pocket. We were taken to Albany Street Station House, and the next day committed for trial at the Sessions. I had twelve months' imprisonment for this offence, and the other two got four years' penal servitude on account of previous convictions. I had only summary convictions, which was not produced at the trial. At this time, summary convictions were not brought against a prisoner committed for trial. We were frequently watched by the police and detectives, who followed our track, and were often in the same places of amusement with us. We knew them as well as they knew us, and often eluded them. Their following us has often been the means of our doing nothing on many of these occasions, as we knew their eye was upon us. I came out of prison three or four days before the gathering of the Chartists on Kennington Common. My female friend met me as I came out. I went to this gathering on 10th of April, 1848, along with three other men. I took several ladies' purses there, amounting to three or four pounds, when we saw a gentleman place a pocket book in the tail of his coat. Though I had done nothing at the tail for a long time, it was too great a temptation, and I immediately seized it. There was a bundle of bank notes in it, seven ten-pound notes, two for twenty pounds, and five-pound notes. Lovely. We got from the fence or receiver four pounds, ten shillings for each of the five pounds, eight pounds, ten shillings for the tens, and eighteen pounds for the twenty-pound notes. The same afternoon I took a purse in Trafalgar Square with about eighteen sovereigns in it. I kept walking in company with the same men till the commencement of 1849, when I was taken ill and laid up with rheumatism. I lost the use of my legs in a great measure, and could not walk, and paid away my money to physicians. Before I got better, 
Such articles as we had were disposed of, though my girl helped me as well as she could. In the early part of 1849, when I was not able to go out and do anything, Sally, who cohabited with me, went out along with another girl and commenced stealing in omnibuses. She was well-dressed and had a respectable appearance. I did not learn her to pick pockets and was averse to it at first, as I did not wish to bring her into danger. I think she was trained by my pals. She was very clever and supported me till I was able to go out again. I had to walk with a crutch for some time, but gradually got better and stronger. Some time after that, I got into a row at the Seven Dials and was sent for a month to Westminster Prison for an assault. When I came out, I was sorry to find that Sally was taken up and committed for trial for an omnibus robbery and had got six months' imprisonment at Westminster. This was in 1850. I succeeded very well during the time she was in prison in picking ladies' pockets during the time of the Great Exhibition at Hyde Park. When she came out, I had nearly two hundred pounds by me. I did not go out for some time and soon made the money fly, for I was then a cribbage player and would stake as much as two or three pounds on a game. In the end of the year 1851, I was pressed for the first time to have an hand at a crack in the city along with two other men. I was led through their representations to believe they were experienced burglars, but found out afterwards, if they were experienced, they were not very clever. Though they got a plan, they blundered in the execution of it, in getting into the place, and went into the wrong room, so that they had to get through another wall, which caused us to be so late that it was grey in the morning before we got away, and we did not find so much as we expected. At the back of the premises we cut our way into the passage, and, according to the directions given to us in the plan that had been drawn, we had to go up to the second floor and enter a door there. We found nothing in the room we had entered but neckties and collars which would not have paid for us for bringing them away. We then had to work our way through a back wall before we got into the apartment where the silks were stored. They cut through the brick wall very cleverly. We had all taken rum to steady our nerve before we went to work. We had gone up the wrong staircase, which was the cause of our having to cut through the wall. There was only one man that slept in the house, and he was in a room on the basement. We, at last, after much labour and delay, got into the right room, pressed the bolt back, and found we could get away by the other staircase. We got silks, handkerchiefs, and other drapery goods, and about eighteen pounds each after disposing of them, which was about two-thirds of the value. We had a cab to carry away the things for us to the fence who received them. We went to another burglary at uh, Islington and made an entrance into the house, but were disturbed and ran away over several walls and gardens. We attempted a third burglary in the city. As usual, we had a plan of it through a man that had been at work there, who put it up for us. This was a shop in which there were a great many Geneva watches. We got in at this time by the back window and went upstairs. We were told that the master went away at eleven o'clock. On this occasion, he had remained later than usual, looking over his business books. <laughs> On seeing us, he made an outcry and struggled with us. Assistance came immediately. Two policemen ran up to the house. In the scramble with the man in the house, we tried to make for the door. The police could not get in, as the door was bolted. We were determined to make a rush out. I undid the chain and drew back the bolt. I got away and had fled along two or three streets, when I was stunned by a man who carried a closed umbrella. Hearing the cry of, Stop, thief! <laughs> he drew out the umbrella, and I fell as I was running. <laughs> I was thereupon taken back by one of the police, and found both the others in custody. We were committed for trial next day, and sent to Newgate in the meantime for detention. My former convictions were not brought against me. My two companions had been previously at Newgate and were sentenced the one to ten years and the other to seven years penal servitude, while I got eighteen months' imprisonment in Holloway Prison. I was the younger of the party and had no convictions. I never engaged in a burglary after this. At this time I was twenty-two or twenty-three years of age. I came out of prison in 1853 and was unnerved for some time, though my health was good. 
this was the effect of the solitary confinement. When I came out, I wrote home for the first time I had been in London, and received a letter back, stating my father was dead after an illness of several years, and that I was to come home, adding that if I required money, they would send it me. Besides, there were several things they were to give me, according to my father's wishes. I went home, and had thoughts of stopping there. My mother was not in such good position as I expected, the property left by my grandfather having gone to a distant relative at my father's death. She was, and is still, in receipt of a weekly sum from the old Wesleyan Fund for the benefit of the widows of ministers. I went home at the end of 1853, and had the full intention of stopping there, though I promised to Sally to be back in a few weeks. I got tired of country life, though my relations were very kind to me, and after remaining seven weeks at home, came back to London again uh, about the commencement of 1854, and commenced working by myself at stealing watches and breast pins. I did not work at ladies' pockets unless I had comrades beside me, or went and mingled in the crowds by myself. In the end of 1854, I got six months' imprisonment at Exhall Police Court, and was sent to Cold Bath Fields, and was told that if I ever came again before the criminal authorities, I would be transported. I came out in 1855, and have done very little since, acting occasionally as a stall to Sally in omnibuses, and generally carrying a portmanteau or something with me. I would generally sit in the omnibus on the opposite side to her, and endeavour to keep the lady as well as I could engaged in conversation, while she sat on her right hand. She got twelve months for this in 1855, and during that time she was in Westminster Prison. I first commenced pattering in the streets. I did not again engage in thieving till the time of the illumination for the peace in 1856. In Hyde Park on this occasion I took a purse from a lady, containing nine sovereigns and some silver, and was living on this money when Sally was discharged at the expiry of her sentence. When she came out, I told her what I had been doing, and found she was much altered, and seemed to have a great disinclination to go out any more. She did not go for some time. I made a sufficient livelihood by pattering in the streets for nearly two years, when I got wet several times and was laid up with illness again. She then became acquainted with a woman who used to go on a different game, termed shoplifting. While the one kept the shopman engaged, the other would purloin a piece of silk or other goods. At this time she took to drink. I found out after this she often got things and sold them before she came home on purpose to get drink. News came to me one day that she had been taken up and committed for trial at Marleybone Police Court. I paid the counsel to plead her case, and she was acquitted. I then told her if she was not satisfied with what I was doing as patterer that I would commence my former employment. So I did for some time during last year, till I had three separate remands at the House of Detention, Clerkenwell. The policeman got the stolen property, but was so much engrossed taking me, he had lost sight of the prosecutor, who was never found, and I got acquitted. On this occasion, I told Sally I would never engage in stealing again, and I've kept my word. I know if I had been tried at this time and found guilty, I should have been transported. I've since then got my living by pattering in the streets. I earn my two shillings or two shillings sixpence in an hour, or an hour and a an half in the evening, and can make a shift. For six or seven years, when engaged in picking pockets, I earned a good deal of money. Our house expenses many weeks would average from four to five pounds, living on the best fare, and besides, we went to theatres and places of amusement, occasionally to the cider cellars and the coal hole. The London pickpockets are acquainted generally with each other and help their comrades in difficulty. They frequently meet with many of the burglars. A great number of the women of pickpockets and burglars are shoplifters, as they require to support themselves when their men are in prison. A woman would be considered useless to a man if she could not get him the use of a counsel and keep him for a few days after he comes out, which she does by shoplifting and picking pockets in omnibuses, the latter being termed mal-tooling. I've associated a good deal with the pickpockets over London in different districts, 
You cannot easily calculate the weekly income, as it is so precarious. Perhaps one day getting twenty or thirty pounds, and another day being totally unsuccessful. They are, in general, very superstitious, and if anything cross them, they will do nothing. If they see a person they have formerly robbed, they expect bad luck, and will not attempt anything. They are very generous in helping each other when they get into difficulty or trouble, but have no societies, as they could not be kept up. Many of them may be in prison five or six months of the year. Some may get a long penal servitude or transportation, or they may have the steel taken out of them and give up this restless criminal mode of life. They do not generally find stealing gentlemen's watches so profitable as picking ladies' pockets. For this reason, the purse can be thrown away, some of the coins changed, and they may set to work again immediately. Whereas, when they take a watch, they must go immediately to the fence with it. It is not safe to keep it on their person. A good silver watch will now bring little more than twenty-five or thirty shillings, even if the watch has cost six pounds. A good gold watch will not fetch above four pounds. I've worked for two or three hours, and have got perhaps six different purses during that time. The purses I threw away, so that the robbery may not be traced. Suppose you take a watch, and you place it in your pocket, while you've also your own watch. If you happen to be detected, you are taken and searched, and there being a second watch found on you, <laughs> the evidence is complete against you. The trousers' pockets are seldom picked, except in a crowd. It is almost impossible to do this on any other occasion, such as when walking in the street. A prostitute may occasionally do it, Paddering her fingers about a man's person when he is off his guard. I believe a large number of the thieves of London come from the provinces, and from the large towns, such as Leeds, Birmingham, Sheffield, Manchester, and Liverpool. From Birmingham especially, more than any other town in England. There are no foreigners pickpockets in London so far as I know. Oh, the cleverest of the native London thieves, in general are the Irish Cockneys. Big Gurra. <laughs> I never learned any business or trade, and I never did an odd day's work in my life, and have to take to pattering for a livelihood. When men in my position take to an honest employment, they are sometimes pointed out by some of the police as having been formerly convicted thieves, and are often dismissed from service, and driven back into criminal courses. I am a sceptic in my religious opinions, which was a stumbling block in the way of several missionaries and other philanthropic men assisting me. I have read Payne, and Volney, and Hollyoke, those infidel writers, and have also read the works of Bulwer, Dickens, and numbers of others. It gives a zest to us in our criminal life, that we do not know how long we may be at liberty to enjoy ourselves. This strengthens the attachment between pickpockets and their women, who, I believe, have a stronger liking to each other, in many cases, than married people.